text number nine. As far as what's happened thus far, um, as far as what's happened thus far, Arjuna, our protagonist, the hero of our story, um, he's found himself in an impossible situation. That situation is that the fate of the world depends on him fighting to defend a good cause, to fight for justice. But the people he's going to have to fight against are his family members. Specifically, he's going to have to fight against his teacher, Dronacharya, and his grandfather, Bhishma. And Bhishma is his grandfather, but his father died when he was very young. And so really, for all intents and purposes, um, Bhishma was his father. So Arjun has to fight to save the world, but he has to fight against his loved ones. And, you know, you might think about your loved ones, like you fight against your children or your spouse or something like that. You're good. Uh, you fight against your children or your spouse or something like that. That might be the worst case scenario that you could think of. But in Vedic times, and in this culture, to fight your guru is the, is the worst thing. It's the worst thing. Like sometimes they'll say, you know, this, this will cure you of a sin, even the sin of killing your guru. They'll say that. Or the sin of having sex with your guru's wife is another one that they'll say, which is a little, that's a little, um, I don't know, um, off-color or inappropriate to say, but things in relationship to one's teacher are considered to be the most sacred things, and to betray that trust is the greatest sin conceivable. In fact, it is, kind of has the equivalent of like rape, murder, pedophilia, genocide in Western culture. Like the absolute worst thing you can possibly say or do. And so he's contemplating killing his guru and his father. And, and, you know, your first guru is your father, your mother, your father. And so killing them is considered to be, your father is also considered to be just an awful thing to do. So you've got Arjun, who's fighting against a bunch of his cousins, a bunch of his friends, a bunch of his extended family. But specifically amongst all of them, he's fighting against his guru and his father. And if he doesn't do it, the whole world is going to go to hell. And if he does do it, he kills everybody he holds dear. And people, we don't like to acknowledge this, but ultimately our ideals <clears throat> are represented by people. Think about it. When you think about what it means to have integrity, you might abstract that and you might philosophize about what integrity consists of and you might think about it but the reason why you can abstract and think about um, I'm just having a hard time focusing it's like too much going on The reason why we can think about things abstractly is because somebody has modeled that behavior for us. As a starting place. 
Just like we learn how to speak, we learn how to speak by copying people who are speaking. It's surprising sometimes how children learn language because no one ever teaches them the meaning of words. They just hang out with people who are speaking and figure it out by mimicry, by emulating, by imitation. And they develop the ability to speak in really complex sentences. Usually by the age of three, they can speak in sentences which no animal on the planet could ever speak in through recursion and language. Um, so I'm going to try to make this point. It's a, I feel like it's a little bit of a delicate point. And between the baby crying and the idea of walking and them making noise, I'm having a hard time thinking it through. And so it's even harder for me to explain it. Um, I'm, I'm arguing that I'm arguing that um, prior to learning how to think about concepts and ideas abstractly, you have to meet somebody who exemplifies those ideas or ideals in real life. And then you build off of that real life example, and then you can speak about it abstractly. And so sometimes we speak about our value system, but ultimately I'm arguing that you can trace your value system down to a group of people who represent that value system. So if you believe in strength, there was someone in your life who taught you what it meant to be strong, who taught you that strength was a value, who taught that strength should be cultivated. I guess if I'm thinking about maybe you suffered from weakness and then you abstractly thought that, okay, strength is the opposite of weakness and so you could grow up and suffer. But I, I believe that automatically prior to that you would have had some examples because no one's raised in a vacuum. So you could say, you know, that somebody had to just learn by reinventing the wheel. Um, but as social mammals, we're never subjected to a situation where we're actually living in a vacuum. And therefore, we've always got people that we're building on. Now, you might nuance it. You might meet somebody and they have strength, but their strength has some deficiencies. So then you try to not throw out the baby with the bath while you start to think about what real strength would look like, what real beauty would look like, what real truth would look like, what real dignity would look like, what real integrity would look like. But I'm, I'm presenting the social psychology argument, which is that because we are social mammals and we're raised in packs and we're raised in tribes and clans, and we model our behavior and our speech after people who are speaking, and none of us are raised in a vacuum, along with the ability to think, we learn how to speak, and as a result of speaking, we think, because we think in language. And thoughts devoid of language are just impressions. And so as a child learns to think as a modern human thinks, as a, an adult human thinks, as, uh, as we learn to think, we learn to think while we're learning to speak. And so we don't just learn from a book. We don't just learn in a vacuum. We don't just learn ideas. We encounter individuals who exemplify or, or, or uh, epitomize or symbolize those ideals. We learn from them and then we build a philosophy or an idea of value out of that. And by the time you're philosophizing about what is integrity or what is worth pursuing, you've already got a voice in your head, largely constructed of your early guides, the voice of your conscience, for better or for worse, that is, is literally other people living inside you and the impression of them speaks and sometimes you even hear their voice inside you. You seem confused. Not you. You look bewildered. Did you follow what I said? What did I say? No. I said that 
by the time you're thinking about your value system, you've already got a voice in your head or sometimes multiple voices of those early guides that you might call your conscience, but it's actually the indoctrinated voice of your early guides that has now become so much a part of you, it lives in you and you hear it. Did you hear it the second time? Okay. You weren't paying attention. This isn't the time in class to not pay attention. Generally speaking, I don't think in my classes it's ever a good idea to not pay attention. Because I'm usually moving faster than you guys. And so it's just everything you can do to try and keep, keep up. And even if I repeat something two or three times, I don't think you got it the first time. So, Arjuna was really fighting against the people who epitomized his own highest ideals in life. We don't think like that. We don't really admit that, you know, what we believe came from other people. So even we get manipulated by advertising and by social media, and by influencers who influence us. And we're copying people. And we're wearing the colors of the season that were, you know, picked out, you know, on the runways of Europe, and then trickled down until they, you know, they became the, the clothes we buy at Allo or wherever we shop at. Um, we think, oh, I picked that color, but you didn't pick that color. That color was conceived of by others, brought, brought back out, and made popular. And then you saw it, and you thought, wow, that's a cool car. That's a cool this. That's a cool that. I want that thing. And we think, oh, it's just me. I'm just expressing myself. But that's just because we're dishonest and we can't admit I'm following this person. It's funny, but if you look at social media, it's quite honest. You, who are you following? You become an influencer and people follow you. It's, it's an honest assessment of what it means to be a leader and to have followers. You influence people and they follow you. We don't like to admit that because it puts you in a vulnerable situation because you're admitting that people have control over you. So we try to say, no, I'm a free thinker. I'm doing everything from my own choice. But we don't reinvent the wheel. We don't start from scratch. Our free thinking isn't us just making stuff up out of nowhere. We put on clothes, pants and shirts. It's, that's not the only option for stuff you can wear. But somehow we you know, put on pants and shirts, or we put on dresses. Even, even you cross-dress, and you're a guy or a girl, and you put on the clothes of the opposite gender, you're still fitting into a binary gender model because you're putting on the clothes of a distinct gender group may be the opposite the one. If you're gender fluid, you're still borrowing and putting together elements of both genders and the clothes other people created long before you ever existed. You didn't make up the idea of pants or arrive at the idea of shorts or arrive at the idea of a skirt all on your own. It's a lie. You borrowed everything. Your concept of necklaces and, and earrings and hairstyles and dyeing your hair and like everything else people do from combing your hair with a comb or wearing clothes or dry. It's like it's all borrowed plumes. We are professional borrowers. It's not a question of whether or not you're influenced. It's a question of who you're influenced by. And so, like, the ancient Greeks would say, you know, I got my courage from Apollo, and I got my intelligence and my wisdom from Athena. They would give credit sometimes to gods for their thoughts and ideas. And, of course, we see sometimes people blaming the devil for mistakes. The devil made me do it. So it can be a disempowering idea. But it can also be honest. You rec recognize that others are responsible for even your virtues. And you give them credit. 
And those virtues are personified as the deity, the good, the true, and the beautiful. That's a kind of a Greek concept of divinity, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so this, what we would see as being somewhat uh, like simplistic and pre-philosophical animism, where people personify qualities or characteristics, I would actually argue that that's honest. Because how do we experience honesty and integrity and this and that? You'll think you just think about it and, 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 and um, uh, kind of uh, ruminate on it. But it's not true. You borrowed it from people. You met an honest person and understood what honesty was by looking at the way they lived their life. These qualities, these ideas were all given to you by other people along with language, along with your value system. Then as you get older, you begin to think it through and examine what was given to you and decide what you're going to jettison and what you're going to keep. But honestly, what it really amounts to is you just choose different people to follow. You don't get stop following people and then go back to some sort of pre-civilized state where you are inventing fire <laughs> and discovering everything. You're eating mushrooms and evolving from a Neanderthal to like a humanoid st a human state. That's not what's going on. You just choose to follow different people. Being honest about this, which I think many old cultures were, and that's in sharp contrast to the way most people think about such topics now, which is why it took me so long to gather my thoughts and, and, and present them. Uh, in contrast to the way we view things, where we try to take credit for everything, blame other people for everything bad that happens, it's like our parents' fault or other people's fault, maybe it's the devil's fault for everything bad, but then somehow we get credit for all the good stuff that happened in life. Even if we give some, I don't know, some cheesy, it's all God, kind of Kanye West type deal, um, there's just tremendous ownership of all your good ideas. And then you try to, to give away all your bad ideas and blame other people. But the truth is, most of your ideas, most of your ideals, most of your thoughts are borrowed from others, and a smart person, a wise person, is someone who's learned to be influenced by uplifting good people, who's learned to borrow ideas from really smart, really civilized, really integrated people, and through osmosis has made those ideas one's, one's own. Do you guys follow that? So in an old world culture, to kill your guru, to kill your parent is the worst thing because in some ways you're killing your own sense of virtue and everything you stand for as it is instantiated in an individual. Your guru and your parents represent your highest ideals and so to kill them, and actually even Freud kind of understood this. Freud had the idea that you know a man, a boy wouldn't really become a man until his father died. I think it's sort of a unnecessarily negative view of things, but there is a sense in which you have to start to pick and choose what you're going to accept and look at things dispassionately and suffer on your own and take responsibility. But that taking responsibility is taking responsibility for who you're going to borrow from, for who you're going to be influenced by, not whether or not you're influenced. Did you guys follow that argument? took me a little while to make it. This is why for Arjuna it was such a big deal. And he went through a real dark night of soul. He thought about his own happiness. He thought about the happiness of his tribe. He thought about just the basic moral idea independent of his own happiness. Just what was right and what was wrong. And he surveyed the situation, bouncing back and forth between a duty-based ethic, what's right, and a results-based ethic, what gives me the result I want. And he ultimately fell apart the seams. But he was sincere. And Krishna then 
fomented the problem and pushed him and called him every dirty name in the book, impotent and uh, infamous and not going to heaven and uncivilized, Anarya and Akirti and Aswarga and uh, uh, Klaibya, impotent. He called him kind of every dirty name in the book, which just broke Arjuna. And Arjuna finally got to that moment where he said to Krishna, I'm ready to surrender and listen. Now that doesn't mean you turn off your intellectual powers. It means you learn to control your impulses and actually listen. You still have to fathom what it is you heard. You still have to decide whether to accept it or not. You don't become blind by listening or indoctrinated or uh, um, uh, brainwashed. Rather, you have the ability to then upgrade so much more so than if you're sitting around trying to rub sticks together and make fire by, by inheriting or borrowing and, and standing on the shoulders of giants and getting a massive uplift where you can encounter ideas you might not have figured out in lifetimes, in hundreds of lifetimes, in thousands of lifetimes. You encounter these wisdom traditions and you're getting access to millions of lifetimes of wisdom. And sometimes it's so beautiful what they come up with, it's revelatory. And you think it must have been given from above. And so Arjuna finally got to a place where he was going to focus and learn and listen. And that's what happened last week. And he says to Krishna, Shishasteham, I am your disciple. Shadimam, instruct me. Tvam prapanam, I'm surrendered to you. And then the next verse is text 9. Having spoken thus, Arjuna chastising the enemies, told Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight, and fell silent. Nayotye, I won't fight. And then he fell silent. Now what's interesting about that, what's interesting about this statement? What's interesting about the chronology of this statement from Arjuna? He just, has to be instructed. he just said, I'm surrendered, instruct me, and the next thing out of his mouth is, I'm not going to fight. And that's, that's, that's how it goes. A lot of times people be like, I'm going to stop drinking, and then they go out and drink the next day. And maybe they go sober the following day. Or they say, I'm going to go on a diet, and then they, they, they break their diet, and then a couple days later they get on their diet. I'm going to start working out, and then you start working out a few days later. This happens all the time where they have a good idea, and they think, okay, I should do this. This is the right thing to do. I'm going to make a move in the right direction. And then they're still not quite there yet. Sometimes your ideals are up ahead of your own desires, and you attach yourself to some idea that's beyond you, that really belongs to somebody else. And you say, oh, that's me, but it's not you. You're over here. They're over there. And you say, yeah, that's me, but it's not you. And then you have to contend with the fact that you're still here, and you have to start moving in that direction. You guys have, of course, all experienced that. I have to ask. I know you've all experienced this. And so um, it's interesting that that happens in the Gita as well. And Krishna doesn't take him seriously and say, you're not sincere. You don't want to be my student. Krishna lets him off the hook and begins to instruct him. And so Arjuna's been venting, and he finally asked for some help, but he had just a little bit on the tail end of asking for help. Sometimes people do this, they'll ask you a question, and then they'll tell you what they think. Have you ever had that happen? It's regular. In fact, if somebody ever asks you for your advice, and you want to have an interesting experience, say to them when they say to you, tell me what to do, or what do you think, or what should I do? Say to them, I don't know, what do you think? And 
I'd say 90% of the time, they will just go on and on and on. And then, and then half the time, that's it. It's done. They'll just tell you what they think. And they'll be like, thanks so much for your advice. I'm like, no problem. But you didn't give any advice. You said, what do you think? And then they told you what they think, and they walked away. They didn't really want to know what you thought. They just wanted to check the box. that They, they cared what you thought. And sometimes they'll ask you multiple times what you think, and every time you go, I don't know, what do you think? They'll just go on for another 20 minutes. And then eventually they'll meander back to or get back to, what do you think? And you can sometimes play that game with people three, four, five times. Because they're just not spent. They're just not... They're just not ready to hear. And then sometimes they'll ask you, what do you think? And, and then you'll say, I don't know, what do you think? And they'll go, no, no, I really want to know what you think. And then somebody's ready to listen. So our just had like a little bit left to get out. Like a little bit left in the tank he had to bleed out, you know? He was almost there. He was sincere. But just a little bit, he was in a dark place. And sometimes when you ask for help and you're in a dark place, that's just, it's, you're asking for help doesn't get you immediately out of the dark place. You're still in a dark place. Someone needs to pull you out. And so you might realize, I'm a super negative person. I'm criticizing people unnecessarily. I really need to deal with that. And then right after you say that, you say something negative. And so a lot of times our ideals, because they're not ours, because they belong to other people, because we're trying to make them ours, through being influenced and choosing to listen to the right people, we attach ourselves to ideals and they're not really ours yet. And we gotta earn them. We identify them and then we earn them. Do you guys follow this? And this presentation, there's, you know, there's no new ideas and you inherited everything, it's called social psychology. It's not, or it's an element of social psychology and developmental psychology, really. It's kind of a combination of both those. And so I'm not making this stuff up. It's borrowed ideas. I'm also borrowing plumes and being influenced by people when I tell you this stuff. And it's just, I, when I heard it, I was like, yeah, these guys are right. They got it. They're correct. And so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and own it. And when I look at old world cultures, I find in a lot of ways they're more honest than our culture, where we put such a premium on being different and being unique even though we're a bunch of tryhards and a bunch of posers and a bunch of wannabes and a bunch of followers. We're just not honest about it. If you're honest about it, then you know I'm following people and you start to ask, is this the right person to follow? Is this the right, is this the right thing? It's, it's a healthy position. It's, it's better. You're safer. Because you're admitting what you're doing. And so now you're in a position where you're a little bit aloof from it and you can begin to pick and choose. You've got some room to, to grow, room to breathe. Whereas if you're so busy defending that you're doing everything on your own, you don't even know what you're following. So then... At that time, Krishna smiling, this is text 10, in the midst of both the armies spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjuna. So Krishna begins speaking. And like I mentioned before, you could just go ahead and ignore up until this point in the Gita. You could start reading the Gita from this next verse or the subsequent verse. And with one minute of background, you'd be able to make sense of it, and with no background, you'd still get what you needed. Everything up to this point is background, and the Gita, as a philosophical treatise, really stands independently of that background. There's value in understanding the, the context, but it's not absolutely essential. And so Krishna's opening gambit, when he's not just provoking Arjuna, and fomenting his existential crisis and his panic attack. Um, his opening line is the next line. Krishna says, while speaking learned words, you are mourning 
for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. You are pragya bhasha se. You are saying the words of a wise person. But you are lamenting for what isn't worthy of grief because if you were actually wise, you would know that you shouldn't lament over living or dead people. Prabhupada, the purport, really highlights right at the outset what's going on by paraphrasing. The Lord at once took the position of the teacher and chastised the student, calling him, indirectly, a fool. The Lord said, quote, You are talking like a learned man, but you do not know that one who is learned, one who knows what is the body and what is the soul, does not lament for the living or the dead. And so Arjuna is lamenting about killing people, about people dying, and Krishna is saying, that's the proof that you're not learned. You sound learned, you're making arguments, you're using fancy language, you appear to be philosophically inclined, but your foundational worldview is off. And so Krishna does what any good philosopher does. He starts with an ontological assertion. In traditional philosophy, there's four branches, cosmology, ontology, epistemology, and, and aesthetics. There's where does everything come from, that's cosmology. What really exists, that's ontology. For instance, you know, uh, uh, and, and you know, modern science isn't exempt from this. So the, the, the standard theory of modern science is that everything came from a Big Bang. And then what exists? Well, what exists is quanta. Little tiny sub-subatomic particles like bosons and neutrinos that then make up subatomic particles like protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then just, you know, it goes on to make atoms. Like, you know, and, then, and, then, and then it goes on to make molecules and then it goes on to make the world that we see. Do you guys follow this? So, um, Krishna's also beginning with an ontology. And the ontology is that, well, he hasn't actually laid out his ontology yet. He's made a statement that wise people don't lament for whether people are living or dying. He hasn't told us why they don't lament. So in some ways it's foreshadowing. He hasn't really stated his case yet. I'm getting a little ahead. But Krishna has made a, a quizzical statement that challenges Arjuna. Krishna's statement is, the fact that you're having a nervous breakdown proves that you're an idiot. There's no actual dilemma here. You've created an artificial dilemma, an artificial dichotomy. You've created an artificial problem where there is none. Like if somebody was freaking out, they couldn't open their car door. And then you just point out to them, you know, there's a handle right here. You just lift it up and it opens your door. And they're like bashing their face against their car and, and having a panic attack and freaking out and rolling under the car and spazzing out and crying and making a bunch of noise. And then you just say, no, just lift your car, hand, door handle up and open the door. So what's the problem? Or they're freaking out, they've lost their keys and they need to buy a new car or have a locksmith come and they're just losing their mind about it, you know, they're like shooting up heroin over it, really like losing, losing their marbles over it. But their keys are, you know, in their pocket, like hanging out of their shirt pocket, like the keys are right there. So Krishna's saying that the fact that you're lamenting is the proof that you're a fool. Because smart people, wise people, don't cry about dying people or living people. They're aloof from such things. Now that's a strange position. Arjuna could say, could respond. In fact, one of our commentators about three centuries ago, he went through and did a whole subtextual conversation that 
every time Krishna would say something, Arjuna had a thought, and then Krishna was responding. So, and, and the thought that he ascribes to Arjuna really helps you understand the flow of Krishna's line of argumentation. Because sometimes when you make an argument, a systematic argument, you anticipate somebody disagreeing with you. So while you're arguing, you're, you, make an, you make a statement. Aristotle said there's, there's two things you do in a speech. You say something, then you prove it. And so you'll make a statement, then you'll prove it. Then you'll anticipate a potential doubt, then you'll resolve that. And so by the commentator adding in this subtextual conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, he really helps you understand the flow of Krishna's argument. And so his position is that Arjuna would respond to this by saying, what do you mean? My family members are all about to die. There's going to be a river of blood and there's going to be severed limbs and people are going to die and it's going to be all over. You follow? And then Krishna thinking that Arjuna might be thinking like that, in response to his radical assertion, Krishna says, never was there a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Okay, so now Arjuna's arguing that nobody actually dies. To which Arjuna would respond saying, what are you talking about? I, 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 we bury people. We, they don't bury people in Vedic culture. If you're a small child, they bury you. But if you're an adult past you know, a certain age, I think it's maybe three or five or eight, um, then you get buried. It's understood small, small children don't have any karma, so they just bury you. Whereas if you pass a certain age, you, you have some karma, and so they burn your body to wrap things up for you. Um, so Krishna's first statement is, you are a fool. The fact that you are disturbed by this battle is proof you're a fool. And Arjuna's response to that is, what are you talking about? Everybody's going to die. And Krishna's response is, no, nobody dies. It's like a Jedi mind trick. You know? There's no problem. You're like, oh, okay. Walk, walk off. So Krishna's response is equally quizzical. No one dies. Everyone lives forever. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? There's, uh, there's dead bodies. There's about to be dead bodies all over the place, right? And now Krishna begins to flesh out his position. Knowing his position, we could read into what he said. But we don't want to read into what he said because then he doesn't get a chance to evolve his own argument. And so the next verse from Krishna is, as the embodied soul continually passes in this body, from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death, a sober person is not bewildered by such a change. So now Krishna's added an actual argument. He's given some evidence. You are the soul. You have a body. The, 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 the first, the, the verse is dehina. Dehina, the word, the word yoga, someone who does yoga is called a what? Yogi. And so when you put the I on the end of the word yoga, it becomes someone who possesses yoga, someone who does yoga. So deha means body. And the person who possesses a body is called dehi. Dehi naha. Of the person who possesses a body. Asmin. In this body. Dehi no asmin yata dehe. In this dehe. In this body. Dehi naha. The person who possesses the body. So they're obviously not the body because they possess a body. So the Sanskrit word for the soul is dehi, the one who possesses a body. You are a soul, you have a body, get it? But by saying you have a body, it means that you are not the body because you have it. Dehi no smin yata dehi. Just as the person who possesses a body in this body 
Gomarang, Yovanang, Jada. They go through Gomara, Yovana, and Jara. Childhood, youth, and old age. Tata Deha Antara Prapti. Thank you. And when the body is ended, they get another body. Dira, a sober person, a learned person, Tatra na muhyati, is not bewildered by this, is not disturbed by this. A sober person knows that they are the soul, that you are the soul, that they are not the body, that you are not the body. They notice that the body goes from boyhood to youth to old age, or girlhood to youth to old age. They notice the body changing while we occupy it. But they realize that there's a part of you that doesn't change. There's a witnesser of the change of the body that doesn't change. You might even change your mind, which is proof that you're also not your mind. But there is a straight witness that witnesses the body and the mind changing. Aloof. I used to think this way. Now I think this way. I used to look like this. Now I look like this. There is a part of your consciousness that witnesses all the changes of your mind, all the changes of your body, which proves that it is not those changes. It's aloof. The metacognitive part of yourself that can think about thinking, that can think about feeling, that can watch your thoughts, and therefore proves that it is distinct from specific thoughts or the body. Therefore, the soul is Dehi. It's the possessor of the body. And the body goes through boyhood, youth, old age, girlhood, youth, old age. But there's a part of you that stays the same, even though the body's changing. And therefore, we can extrapolate from that. We can adduce from that that when the body disintegrates altogether, that you will receive a new body. So Krishna makes an argument. You're a fool for lamenting. Arjuna says, why am I a fool? All my loved ones are about to die. Krishna says, none of us will ever die. <laughs> Arjuna goes, what are you talking about? It sounds totally foolish. And Krishna's response is to say, no, actually think about it. Think about your own experience in this world, in a body. And if you do it right, you'll be able to realize you're not the body. You're the possessor of the body. And as your mentality and as your experience and as your body is changing, there's a part of you that still stays the same. And you can adduce from that or you can extrapolate from that. And you can consider that when the body dies altogether, there's no reason why you should not continue to go on. And therefore, no one ever dies. And therefore, you should not lament for them dying. Do you follow this? That is an earth-shattering, radical worldview that leads people to take lifelong vows of celibacy and move into a monastery and go to the forest and quit their jobs and live a life of voluntary poverty and pursue self-realization as the goal of their life because they realize how transient and ephemeral everything in this world is and how it's not worth investing time in and how what we should really be investing time in is the study of the self. And human life is meant for self-realization, not sense gratification. And we should live simply and think high. This worldview is the worldview of spiritualists the world over. It is a radical idea. It is a dangerous idea. It is a subversive idea. And it flies in the face of every form of materialism known to man. Including feeding starving children in South America. 
it gets really subversive because everything that people do, even the good stuff in this world, starts to seem quite paltry and like it's participating in the delusion. Do you follow that? Because all those kids you save are going to grow up and grow old and die. And if that's what you're spending your time thinking about, then you've just bought into the idea that you're doing the best thing you can do in the body. But you bought into the idea you're the body, and you're helping other people to think they're the body, and everybody's identifying with the body, which ultimately means you suffer way more than if you realize you're not the body. It's such a d disturbing idea. We take it as sacrosanct. You know, feeding suffering children in, in Africa or in South America or in the U.S. even. We don't have quite as many starving kids as other countries, but we have some starving kids, uh, maybe at least malnourished. I mean, the numbers for growth stunted, you know, where you're six inches smaller than you should be, I think it's three to five million per year. Most of those are in the U.S. And I think another three million kids straight die of starvation every year. Most of those, again, aren't in the U.S. We have people eating junk. We have people skipping meals. That's a heck of a lot. We have food insecurity. But we got first world problems in this country. Other countries, I mean, I read an article about a lady in Darfur. Darfur was uh, maybe a decade back. Central Africa, radical Muslims and also Chinese uh, business interests. And these radical Muslims went and took over areas. They kill all the men, cut off the limbs of all the children so they would never be able to grow up to fight. They'd either kill the children or cut off their arms or their leg. So they're just never going to be able to fight. Because those kids, you know, eight years old, six years old, 10 years from now, they're going to pick up guns and come and kill us. So they, 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 they make them amputees. Rape the women, genocide type stuff, you know, um, uh, whatever they call that, I, they have a name for it, but it's, uh, they try to, you know, uh, ethnic cleansing, thank you, ethnic cleansing, and some lady had to walk hundreds of miles with her two children, and there's no water to get to a refugee camp, at a certain point, she got so hungry and so weak, she couldn't carry her two children, so she had to put one of her kids down to die and just left him by the side of the road to die and carried one of the kids to the refugee camp. She was, they were interviewing in the refugee camp and she was in, totally inconsolable because she had to leave her child on the side of the road to certain death by starvation and dehydration because she didn't have the physical strength to continue walking the next 100 miles with her kids. So she just had to leave them to die. Small kid. That kind of stuff's going on we got first world problems in this country. That kind of stuff's going on in the world. And uh, self-realization ultimately challenges that. It doesn't say you can't help pick up the kid and walk into the refugee camp. It does say you can't, have to buy, you can't buy into the illusion that that child is a child. That you have to see that child as an eternal soul, no different from you and that ultimately the body is transient and ephemeral, and that saving bodies is just keeping people incarcerated. You can still have a logic where you don't, you know, where you help feed people and help people, but there has to be a logic that while the person's in the body, you should help them, but you can't really sink your teeth into and buy into the illusion that you are the body, I'm saving you, you're a little child, children are innocent, you can't buy into that anymore. That whole thing has to be dispensed with. And it's way more, we're all eternal beings. These are eternal beings in a child's body, but they've been around forever. I've been around forever. They're suffering their karma. I'm suffering my karma. It is my duty and my dharma to help them by feeding them or this or that. But I have to realize that, I, that this act is not going to actually save them and that their incarceration goes on. And the only thing that's actually going to help them is if they attain self-realization. And so I can feed them or clothe them or carry them to keep them alive and then hopefully they'll be able to attain self-realization. I'll have the opportunity to do that. And in that sense, I've done a small service
to help them perhaps live for long enough where they can start to think about these issues. It's way less sexy, way less seductive, way less this is the most important thing you can possibly do, and way more, yeah, I got to do this, and, but it's, it's not actually that glorious. You follow? This idea that you are not the body is dramatic. It's powerful. It's revelatory. It changes everything. You no longer live on the same planet. You live in a different world. You see things differently. And so Arjuna had all these moral arguments, and Krishna came in and just gutted all of them with self-realization 101. You're not the body. You're the soul. What are you freaking out about? Everybody's going to die. And you know, a lot of old world cultures had this. You know, that, you know, they wanted to die a good death. Samurai culture had this. The Vikings had this. Lots of cultures had this. We're all going to die. Let's die a good death. Let's die a noble death. Life was about putting yourself in a situation where you could die a noble death for a just cause. Go out on the battlefield. Go out on your shield. Instead of, you know, pathetically hanging on for another five minutes, wasting your children's inheritance <laughs> so you can live a few more minutes on morphine while you float away in that demented state, dementia state, dementiated state. I made that up. I'll, I'll Google it later. Um, in a dementia-ridden state because you've lived far beyond your use-by date. It's a whole different way of looking at the world. And Arjuna's thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, they're dying. Okay, fine. I'm not the body. Okay, I accept it. I'm not the body. But what am I supposed to do? I'm in here. People are dying. They're getting old. How am I supposed to get hung up on it? This is the subtext from the commentator. And then Krishna says, The non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course of time are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. So Arjuna has a total freak out. Goes through utilitarian arguments, what's going to make people happy, individually and collectively. Goes through a deontological position what's right, what's sinful, really thinks through what's going to happen to his entire society because of the genocide that's about to take place. He's totally ripped apart by the fact he's having to kill his guru and his father who represent all things good, a la social psychology. And Krishna's response is to, 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 to taunt him a bit so he has a complete nervous breakdown and then to say, you're a fool. And you shouldn't be upset. They're just thinking, why should I be upset? They're about to die. And Krishna says, no, no one dies. We live forever. And I just says, what are you talking about? The, the bodies of like my grandfathers have all, you know, my, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, they've all passed away. I've seen death. What are you talking about? And Krishna says, no, you've seen the death of the body, but you're not the body. You're the witnesser of the body. Then Arjuna says, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? I'm still in the body and it's growing old. And Krishna says, yeah, I just got to tolerate it. Just like summer comes and it's great weather and then winter comes and the weather kind of sucks and days are shorter and you got to deal with it. Just like it's hot outside and it's cold outside but you still have to get up and do your duty and if it's cold out you still got to go and work out and exercise. If it's hot out you still got to go to work. You can't just hang out and lounge all day. Just so um, epicurean that you know, whatever that your sensual feelings are in that moment, you have to do exactly that and nothing else. Life doesn't work like that. You have to learn to tolerate. And so just be zen. Just be cool. Deal with it. So he's presented a position. He's made an argument. He's given evidence. Arjuna's made mental counter-arguments, potentially. Krishna's anticipated them. And he's put forward an argument. What's the argument? Stop, stop crying over spilled milk. We're talking about life and death. No, nobody does. What do you mean? I mean you're not the body, you're the soul. What am I supposed to do as long as I'm in the body? Just tolerate it. You're going to get old. Tolerate it. 
you're already tolerating so many things. I mean, what is adulthood? It's the ability to tolerate. My daughter woke up multiple times last night crying because her foot hurt. I wake up all the time and stuff hurts on me. I don't cry and whimper and then some giants wake up and like come in and massage me until I go to sleep and caress me. Then I, like, then I urinate on myself and they like clean me up and change me. Like, 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 if you think about like what it is to be a child, you just defecate on yourself. And then somebody has to come and clean hey. And then you cry a little bit and they come and change you. I mean, how cool would that be, right? We would never know how to use a toilet. It requires some work. The move from childhood, toddlerhood, to childhood, childhood to adulthood, is, is in many ways the ability to tolerate and control your impulses. And then what would I get if I do all that? You know, now I'm just a stoic. What do I get if I do all that? Those... Um, The person who's not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. Amrita vaya kalpate. You're eligible to transcend this world, to be liberated, to move beyond death. So there's a goal. By tolerating this up and down, you start to sever your connection from the body such that you can see you're not the body and it leads you to a liberated state of existence where you realize you're not the body. Krishna makes a brilliant argument next. He says, those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, there's no endurance, and of the eternal, there's no change. Nasato vidyate bhavo, of that which is asat, unreal, there is no bhava, there is no existence. Na abhavo vidyate sata, but what is real never doesn't exist. In other words, things which change are ultimately unreal. Things which stay the same are ultimately real. Therefore, the soul is real, the body is not, don't get attached to the body. There is an aspect of reality that doesn't change ephemerally and transiently at every moment. There is an aspect of the world, of the self. There is something going on. There's some permanence amidst the temporary. There is some truth amidst the falsity. There is some real amidst the false. What is that? That's the self. Therefore, you should focus on that because it's infinitely more valuable. And when we're creating a hierarchy, close the door, please. And when we're creating a hierarchy of what's valuable and what's not, then the self has value. The self is worth focusing on. And the body is not. You can liaise with the body, you can tolerate, you can feed those kids, but you can't buy into the illusion. Of course, you don't buy into the illusion, it's just it becomes dutiful, it becomes way less seductive, and you really don't think we are the world. You really don't think we're changing the world. You really don't think we're making the world a better place. In some ways, you're just continuing that child's incarceration. Which maybe then they can get out of it. And the final verse, that which pervades the entire body is what's indestructible. What pervades the body? Consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is a symptom of the soul. You have evidence of the self right in front of you. It's your consciousness. And so again, Arjuna is having a total freak out. Krishna mocks him and finally says, you shouldn't be freaking out. Arjuna says, why not? People are dying. Krishna says, no one dies. Arjuna says, what do you mean? I'm watching them die because you're seeing the body die. It's not, it's not, it's not, that's not the self. The self is the possessor of the body. Arjuna goes, okay, well, I'm in the body. I'm still suffering. Yeah, just tolerate it. What do I get for tolerating it? You get to realize you're not the body. You get liberation. And you should meditate on the reality that there are aspects of this world that are forever. And there's aspects that are changing every moment. Focus on the ones that are forever. What's the forever? Consciousness. It's right there. It's in your own self. Look at your own self and you'll see there's an aspect of you which never dies to witness. And so Krishna presents a really strong structured argument 
for the eternality of the soul, for what's worth focusing on. Are we done? Did we go over time? I can't tell you. Okay. Adios, IGTV. Krishna presents a really strong argument for the eternality of the soul. He gives evidence.